Welcome back to Trinity Bible Study. We've been in Acts chapter 4, and we're going to finish it up today. Ironically, what we see happening at the end of chapter 4 is very similar to what we see happening at the end of chapter 2. There is a community of life in Christ that extends beyond just the simple practice of worship services or gathering together for fellowship, but as they live together in community. And it's interesting because I have heard over the years a lot of people try to relate this to communalism or communism even. And there are elements of it that knit together philosophically and even in literal practice. But this is a whole different experience because it is not knit together through social living only or through the aspects of need-based or physical supply. It is knit together by the Holy Spirit, and that's the difference. And that's where it is very difficult to take a passage like this and say, well, these people are communalists or they're communists, because they aren't. They are very simply knit together by faith in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit working and moving in them. And we saw in that last verse that we looked at last week where it says, and they were, uh, and when they had prayed, the place they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. That's Acts chapter 4 verse 31 and we're going to pick up in 32 right after that and see this experience develop. And I'm not going to read it in its complete text together. I'm going to walk through it and break it down as we look at this because it, like I said, is very similar to the end of chapter 2, but there are some unique characteristics we need to amplify and we need to see very clearly. So we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Okay, this means that everybody thinking the, the same way. In other words, there's a unity of the Holy Spirit here that took the emphasis off of personal possessions. Now, this does not mean that they did not have personal possessions but the value of those personal possessions wasn't something they held on to and claimed and said, I have this, this is mine. You know, as the joke goes, stay out of my dumpster. That's not what the attitude here was at all. They may have owned certain things personally, but they were very willing to give them up and or to share them. And that's what we have to glean from this. And that is something that we in America, as Christians, struggle with because we like to have our stuff we like our luxuries and we like our toys and we don't give them up easily picking up in verse 33 and with great power the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all here we see the emphasis of the teaching of salvation being found in the resurrection. Okay, now bear in mind, Paul, who writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, was not a part of this group. He had not even been converted yet. So the message of resurrection is not Paul's little special elite little message. It was from the beginning. And the resurrection is the key point, the hinge pin, shall we say, of our faith that holds it all together. Without the resurrection, our faith is not of any value. Paul says it's void. Okay, it's in vain. So, but even before Paul, we see the emphasis on the resurrection of Christ. If Christ was not raised, there's no point in this. We might remotely have forgiveness from sin through his shed blood, but we don't have the completion of that until the resurrection into new life brings us eternal life in Christ Jesus. So they're preaching this, and it says with great power, and the word power there is explosive power. It's, it's 
really hard to not see it. It's really hard not to experience it because it is so dynamic. In fact, that word dynamos comes from that, that dynamic, that explosive power. It's evident. It's obvious. That's very important to understand. Verse 34, for they were not a needy, there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales, verse 35, and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. In other words, they were taking care of each other at all expense. And if that meant we had to sell a piece of property, we sold a piece of property so that person or that group could have their needs met. And notice it is need-based, not desire or want-based. There's a big difference between what we need and what we want. And when someone says, I would like a new car, the question is, do you need a new car? And sometimes they do. And depending on what they're doing and how that applies to the ministry God has called them to. And most of us live on what we want or what we desire and not necessarily worried much about need. This community was very, very needy. These people lived right hand to left hand because there was not a lot of anything going on. And especially when you come into a communal situation Everyone needs to have their needs met. And these people saw that and they did it. And if that meant they sold something that was near and dear to them to help the group at large, they did it. And what we find out is their needs were met. Because people were not self-centered. They were not selfish. They were not, this is my stuff type of thing. There was no boundaries around their wealth. And there was no boundaries around their possessions. And they obviously share them so people could live. Why would we want people to live? Well, first of all, so they can do the work of the ministry of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's the priority. And second of all, because God loves life. And he created life for us to live and to live it to its fullest. Jesus said in his own words, I have come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. And he's not only talking about spiritual life there, which is the obvious, but he's talking about our regular life. And some people say right away, well, I'm sick or I'm, I can't do what I used to do. And my, you know, all of these physical problems I have, that doesn't sound right to me. God still gives us life. And I have met some dear people who don't have the physical strength to do things that they do by the Spirit. And they can pray and they can talk and they can share their lives with people one-on-one -on -one, that they can't do a lot of physical things because of their physical limitations or their illnesses or their diseases. God still use them. Jesus can give life more abundantly. Let's pick up. We see an example of this in verse 36. And Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he gives an example here of not only just Jewish people who are native to Jerusalem, or maybe even to Galilee, as we would see Peter and John being in that situation, but here is a man who was born outside of the Palestinian territory, shall we say, in the Roman Empire, and yet he's Jewish, he's Levite by his genetic heritage, so he's there in Jerusalem, and he has obviously joined this group, and Barnabas, we'll hear about a lot later on in Acts, and we'll see how God used him in this ministry, and it starts that relationship by him selling his property, by him being willing to let go of what he has to help the, the Christians who are there in Jerusalem, and he is a part of that community. That example is going to be very important, and we'll talk about that later in the book of Acts. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that we can learn and apply. Touch it to our hearts, and let us know you better, and more deeply and more intimately. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, and under his authority. Amen.